All right, hey guys, welcome to our fifth MicroMouse lecture. Today we're going to be talking about maze solving. Uh, very exciting. Well, before before we get to that, we have a couple announcements for you guys. Yeah, first off, great job everyone on your PCBs. Those are currently being manufactured. So Ty and I are going to assemble those over spring break and get them shipped out to you. So you should hopefully have them at the start of spring quarter. I'm personally really excited to see all of them. I hope you guys are too, because they're, they're pretty solid. Um, also, just heads up, there's or just a reminder that there's all these GB takeovers happening. So this weekend, it's is it prom or prom? I don't it's know. Prom. How it's definitely prom. 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 <laughs> yeah, you should pull up if you want to. Um, there's the RSVP forms and more info on the IEEE Discord. Um, yeah, don't worry if you don't have a date. They're uh, they're grouping that we're all they're doing groups of three or triodes or whatever i don't know what they're doing <laughs> and okay. we're all electrical and computer engineers and other so uh chances of other people also having a date are on the lower end bradley did you really hey, i'm just <laughs> i'm just putting it out there it's all like right. all right well anyways uh, yeah. moving on Let's, uh, let's get to the lecture. So today we'll be talking, first introducing a couple uh, basic maze solving algorithms and then uh, the fancy one that we use a MicroMouse uh, flood fill. So next, oh, that's the button, okay, cool. So let's see. So the whole point of the end goal of MicroMouse is to get your little robot to a uh, Get, find the center of a maze. Uh, typically, it's a 16 by 16 maze. This this year, uh, that's a lot of cardboard. But, um, uh, yeah, so you need a, it needs to get to the center of the maze. And all it has to work with are has its internal memory on the microcontroller and the IR sensors uh, that will be uh, in the form of your IR breakout boards coming soon. So task is use some smart algorithms to make it happen. So uh, first, there's a there's a couple here. So what you guys implemented during the IR assignment and for the rock competition is uh, more officially named dead reckoning. It goes until it hits a wall, and then it turns appropriately. Um, it's really good at not hitting stuff, but uh, that's about it. And so uh, that's dead reckoning. There's another one called wall following. Uh, this one. This one's a little more interesting. So uh, right now, I, the, what the animation is showing is a left wall follower. So it's just going to always, it's going to follow along the left wall, uh, as the name implies. Uh, so for simple mazes, like uh, where all the walls are connected, like uh, in this, this maze, if there is a connection right here, so everything's connected together, and the start and end points are along the edges, then this algorithm will 100% of the time solve the maze, so not necessarily with the shortest path. But uh, for MicroMouse, the mazes get a little more complicated. You can see here, since they're, it's not a simple maze where everything's connected, it never gets to the center point. So we need something that can overcome these challenges. That's where flood fill comes in. You wanna, wanna talk yeah. about Bradley? All right, flood fill is a slightly more complicated algorithm um, that just finds the shortest path between a goal and an endpoint and continually updates as you learn more about the maze. Uh, if you want to think about it just from the start, um, it's called flood fill because you can imagine in the same way, if you put a drop of water and then let it flood out and fill, um, fill up the maze, <laughs> um, it'll naturally like lower in height and decrease and like it'll form a slope based on how the water spreads out going farther and farther away from where you want to go and you can think of it as like you want to you follow basically follow that slope as you navigate around the maze um so yeah intuitively like you take the shortest path which is just following the nicest slope that leftmost point since there's a wall in the way the, the water has to flow around it so you can see it gets mm -hmm. to that point last so, um, yeah. So moving on. Um, and then putting a little bit more of a mathematical sense 
to what we like to just instead of just saying water flowing down, we can introduce this kind of more this more mathematical way of thinking about distances in a maze. Because uh, distances in a maze aren't just like Euclidean distance from start to finish. So like the hypotenuse of travel, you have to think about actual distance you're going to travel. So we call that Manhattan distance, which is the distance um, going like, say like, I'm going to go forward, forward, left, forward, forward, turn. And like, if you think about it also is like, if you're walking through a street from like one place to one place, you're going to follow the streets and not just walk straight through the middle of a block. No uh, to keep... buildings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or not like vision. We can't just walk through walls. For those of you who have been getting into one division lately. Um, but yeah, so basically we can use Manhattan distance, which calculates our effective distance going through the maze. Um, and you can see in the diagram at right, we have Manhattan distance for each cell relative to that center cell, which is marked zero. And this map also keeps into account the, the barrier in there too. So the effective distance having to navigate around that barrier of your distance from that endpoint. Yeah, and then just the last point, it's, it's the number of moves it takes to get from a certain cell to the goal. So, so if we start, uh, say, right here, number four, so four, move four, down, 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 left four moves that will apply for all these so it's another way to think of it if that's helpful um all right let's uh let's talk about what this has to do with flood fill okay so um well your uh, mouse is not an amorphous solid or a fluid that can flow through the maze in all directions so it can start at one point and it doesn't know anything about the maze so let's start there so kind of like on the previous slide where we assumed we dropped water out and that we kind of put numbers representing the order in which the water got to the different cells. Let's, uh, let's pretend there are no walls, uh, ignore the blue walls, assume those are unknown. So it's zero, one, two, we'll expand out evenly in all directions. And our mouse is gonna start down here. So um, if the maze looked like this, then the fastest way to get to the center, if you're at four, just go straight, three, two, Turn right, go one, zero. Now you're at the center. Um, so basically, uh, if you have, if you start with these Manhattan distances, this is the maze. Then if you always travel towards the decreasing numbers. You'll end up at the at your goal in the shortest amount of steps. Uh, so let's let's kind of take a look at how this works. So uh, we start with the rat in the bottom left, and uh, the sensors pick up the that first wall on the to its right. Then next obvious step is it goes forwards. And now it sees another wall, but nothing exciting happens yet. It goes forward again, turns right, then goes forwards. And, and just uh, a side note with all of these, you can see that it's going from a higher number to a lower number each step. Yeah. And that's uh that's what makes these moves easy. Yeah. So now we're here, and uh, the rat wants to go forward one more to zero, right? That's that's where it's trying to get to. Uh, but there's a little problem. There's a wall in the way, so rat gets stuck here, and uh, so there's a wall in front. Can't go forwards towards the lower cell, and it's surrounded by cells that are higher in value. So that valid uh, that uh, violates um, the uh, the rule where it always has to go towards a lower number, right? So, uh, well, essentially the mouse has just learned some more information off the maze. It's learned that there's a wall there. So uh, if we imagine, okay, we know these walls are here. So what's the what's the actual path? So imagine if you poured water, uh, you know, a laser pointer. Right, so if you poured water from this cell, um, it wouldn't be able to flow here, so it'd flow up one, two, then down three, flow around this wall, then it'd go in here, so it'd be four, five, six. So if we, uh, ignoring the mathematical and the algorithm, how to actually do this, just imagine, okay, we learned there's a wall there, pour some water there, simulate that, and figure out what the new distance should, should be, then uh, it'll end up look, 
the number new Manhattan distances will be like this. And then once you have your new Manhattan distances, uh, now, now it can keep going. It can go up to two or down to two, one, zero. Now it knows how to get around the wall. So that, does that make sense? Uh, does that make sense? What, um, how we encounter a wall and then uh, we're stuck. So we kind of re-simulate what, what a, if we poured water from zero, what would happen? Does anyone have any questions about that before we continue on to, uh, yeah. No, let's see. All right, so let's keep going. So let's talk about how to implement this in code. So um, I'm going to switch over to a tablet in a sec. But first, I'll uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to switch over to that's why there's two of Tyler's joined into the meeting. While Tyler's doing that, I'll just give a quick intro to some terminology. So we're going to be talking about a queue here. Um, for those of you who haven't taken CS32, I think that's where they introduce it. Um, a queue is essentially a data structure that it's like if you can think of it as waiting in a line, you basically put things into the queue and then you take stuff from the front of the queue and basically you build up a queue of things that need to be done and then you execute them or process them or do something with them in order. So it's like if you're um, you can think of it just like waiting in line first for its first person in first person is the first person out and you just work your way through the tasks you put line up um, yeah. for yourself later on. You'll, you'll kind of see it here as we work through mm -hmm. the example of how it works. So the goal is, so we can intuitively see how the how our poured out water would flow, but how do we get the get a computer to get to produce those same numbers? So this is how we do it. So, um, so where do we start? So we started, the mouse was right here and it was stuck, right? So let's uh, let's go through this algorithm we, I have outlined on the left. So the first step is to add the first current cell, which is L here, to the queue. So my queue is, I should have it shown down here, and uh, write L. OK, cool, that's the first step. OK, great. Uh, second step. So while the queue isn't empty, uh, take the front cell out for consideration. OK, so uh, let's, uh, let's put them right here. Let's, let's look at them. OK, okay. Or it's easier. right right here. Yeah. So next step is get this front cells or cell we just took out it's minimum, get the minimum value of its accessible neighbors. What I mean by accessible is 0 doesn't count because there's a wall in the way. So can someone tell me what the minimum value of its neighbors is? Are? It's not a trick question. The minimum it's value is two. two. It's two. There you go. Thanks, Jonathan. That's Good incredible. Job. Yeah, so there's <laughs> two, two, and two. What's the smallest number there? It's two. Okay, so small, so minimum equals two. Okay, so now we're on this step. Uh, if if this if L's value, which is the one we're looking at, if one one is less than or equal to two, which it is. Uh, okay, now we need to set the current cell's value to the minimum plus one. So, hey, this is not a trick question either. What is two plus one? Three, great. Tyler, you made it too easy for them. How do we know the, the, the <laughs> okay. answer? All right, there we go. Uh, so we set to three, and then uh, last, and then also part of this, we need to add all the accessible neighbors to two. So someone, someone, tell me what to add to the queue. Which cells? Uh, I'm looking for some letters here. G, K, and Q. Perfect. Um, Good job. M. There we go. So let's do, uh, for, uh, for fun reasons, uh, I'm going to put it in this order, but it could be any order. 
Mm, Side note, um, if you think about the order of the cue, Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe the way, the order in which you drew them is the opposite in which you, well, I guess you, they just keep in mind that the things in the cue are coming from the right side and then moving to the left side um, when you yeah, actually so, fill this up. So I put G in first, then I put Q in, then I put K in. Okay. So, um, okay. So now let's run through this. So, uh, okay. All right. Let's go. Uh, we're so back to the top of the while loop. Step A. Uh, take the front cell out for consideration. That's G. So uh, let's uh, let's look at let's look at G. Then uh, then then I then how the queue works. You take the first element out, and everything else moves up one spot in line. Cool. Okay. Step two. Get its minimum value. So uh, G has four neighbors: uh, F, B, H, and L. So the minimum value is one, which is cell H. So one half is um, one is less than the G's value, which is two. So we're good to go. So awesome. ignore that. Okay. Um, all right. So now we go back to the top of the while loop. Take the front cell out. It's Q. I'm not going to draw the Tell yeah. us. Does someone want to tell us what's going to happen with Q before we go over it? We're just going to get rid of Q. And yes. why is that? Because it's three neighboring cells. The minimum is one, and one is less than the value of our current cell, which is two. Perfect. Easy. And I do like how you said three accessible neighbors, because that is true, because P is not an accessible neighbor. All right. Let's get to the, let's get to the, uh, the spicy case. Okay, so one more item in our queue. So let's, uh, all right, what happens here? We're Someone else a... want to volunteer and give us an idea of what they think is gonna happen? Okay. Um, right. Which, okay, so we have two neighbors, right? Okay, two accessible neighbors. So we've got L, we've got P. All right, so their minimum value, so we have three and three. So minimum of those two is three. Uh, two is less than three. So we're going to do this step and change its value to three plus one, which is four and add the neighbors to the queue. So I add L and P. Okay. All right. I'm gonna do one more iteration of this and then I think you'll you'll get that idea. So, uh, so just like what happened with Q that Jonathan said earlier, um, the same thing's gonna happen with L. Let me take it out because L has a valid neighbor that's less than it, as G and Q are both less than three. Okay. Go through the loop again, back to the top. P. All right. P does not have a lower neighbor, so we increase its value by one, or take the minimum value, which is four, add one, that's five. Can someone guess what uh what you what's gonna happen when we do Q or do a U? Should just change U's value to six. Yeah, precisely. And uh, that's a. Uh, this is exactly what we had on the other slide. So when we said like, oh, what should happen if we were to uh, for the poor bucket of water here, it should blow out one, two, three, four, five, six. It takes six steps to get from this cell to the target, which is M. Okay. So how, yeah, yeah. how are people feeling about this? Do a thumbs up if you're feeling good. Um, yeah, or anything else if 
you're not feeling good. Okay, I think that's a pretty good sign. Yeah, so as far as uh, like, oh, if, if it, yeah, this algorithm here, you don't have to understand like, why does this make blood fill work? Um, the, the point is like, this is here. And then when you're doing your assignment, you just implement this exact structure, a while loop, a queue, these these steps in the form of if statements and whatnot. And if you do this, then it's going to uh, successfully perform blood fill and correct the values. So th this used to be one, used to be two, three, four. Now you can see they've all changed to what they should be. Okay. Also, just random quick side note, there is an alternate way to implement this with recursion, but we won't subject you to that. If you're curious, you can do this recursively, but don't sweat it if that is a lot. I personally like recursion more because it's just prettier to me, but um, the queue is definitely easier and it's a better way to teach it. To, uh, okay, I could, uh, okay. Don't want to get too far on tangent, but I want to say uh, recursion's epic, but on microcontrollers, they have limited, uh, they have a limited call stack and limited memory and uh, recursion basically will, if you don't know what recursion is, ignore this discussion, but it'll, it'll use up more resources than if you do it iteratively and with a small queue. So, um, yeah, so, but both are, both give you valid uh, flood fill implementations, so. Yep. Yeah, for those of you who have taken, wait, is it CS30? Is it CS31 or CS32 when you do all this stuff? I think it's 32. It's 30, 32. Yeah, basically the, there's this is like a homework assignment in 32, I think, and you can pretty much see how this plays out. Okay, so you can see from the, oh, from the previous slide, we saw like, okay, intuitively, this is what we should get. And that's, and we, after stepping through this, algorithm that's in fact what we got okay so that's that's all that's there is to say it. about <laughs> the blood fill guys like uh that that's it um i'll just hammer it in one more time okay i think i i don't, I don't know if we need yeah. to do that honestly yeah. okay follow um, the follow the number trail then if you get stuck run the algorithm we just told you and keep doing that and eventually you will find your way to the center that's yes. it yeah yeah that's pretty much it just follow it until you find something illogical which means you need to update your map update then update your map and continue following the trail yeah okay. Alrighty. um yeah i got this there's this epic maze simulator thing that uh, you guys will be using. So uh, on we have an assignment document which has more instructions how to get it and uh, set it up and everything. So the goal here is uh, you're going to implement and test out your maze solver on mazes that are more complicated than this one. Uh, so on, so this will be on like uh, micro mouse mazes from previous competitions. So. If you're able to solve these, then you will be able to succeed in MicroMouse. Um, let's do uh, quite a bit from now, so we have plenty of time. But um, yeah, don't take that as an excuse to put it off for a long time. I know yeah. saying that will make a difference, but uh, okay, yeah, there's... we're giving you a long time because, I mean, at this point, we're just waiting for PCBs to come. But um, like, there's no reason to wait. The quarter, this is the Monday of spring break for those of you who are curious. Okay. All right, uh, Bradley, you had a... Had yeah, a cool. um, just a few tips. We talked about flood fill at a pretty high level of like you have a queue and you put stuff into the queue. Um, so just like some tips to help figure out the nitty gritty details of that, you're gonna need a coordinate system to note each um, maze in the cell, probably just an X and Y coordinate. And you're gonna to have to keep in mind that you're gonna to have to pick a reference point in your maze, probably
probably like one of the corners to have B00. Um, another way that might help keep this more organized is if, if, is if you define a struct like of just like an X coordinate and a Y coordinate so you can easily put in coordinates into a queue. Um, and then you also need a location or a way to store all the data you currently have about your maze. This will be your horizontal walls, your vertical walls, and the Manhattan distances. I would personally recommend having a 2D array for each of your vertical walls and your horizontal walls because then you can just usually say like left and right IR sensors and then like top and bottom. Um, I don't know, that, that, that's the way I would do it. Um, and lastly, just if you need help with debugging, a great way to do that is to just use the printf statement. Um, just because uh, like, well, you, you have to, you run this simulator through a terminal, so it'll print out stuff in the terminal and you can see what your maze, what you, you, or you can have it tell you what your mouse is thinking at, at each step of the way. Derek, to answer your question, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question. And how do you know when your mouse is done? Um, in, in a standard micro mouse competition, you always know the goal is to get to the center um, and that's your target. So if you keep track of your mouse's coordinates, uh, so every time you go straight, y increments by one. Every time you move over one cell, you can you can keep track of where it is. And if uh, if your mouse's coordinates match up with the coordinates of uh, your, your your end goal, then uh, that's it. Let's see. Does the rat know how big the maze is beforehand? Yes, and uh, it doesn't. Uh, let's see. I'm trying, I'm trying, I don't remember if that is or is not a requirement for flood fill to work. Um, it has to be for the, I, I, when you define the size of your of your coordinate structs. Um, yeah, um, at but least, the at thing least is, here. with the with the maze solving simulator, you have the option to create a maze with a specified length. So if you want to start debugging it on smaller mazes, you have that option. I would just recommend going with the sixteen by sixteen from the start. Um, yeah, I, I think so. why not? Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, can you talk more about the arrays necessary or that you'd recommend for storing like the position of the walls that we find? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Well, okay. Let's okay. Let's wrap up the lecture and then we can discuss it. Like uh, like right. So all right. Barring other questions, that's all for today. But uh, I'll, Bradley and I can stick around for a little bit and answer questions like that. Okay. So. Um, um, yeah. yeah. So you basically, if you think about it, if you take all your vertical walls, if you have a 16 by 16 maze, you'll have like two walls on each side um, of each cell, which means, and then you'll have 16 walls going up the maze. So if for your vertical walls, you'll have 17 columns and 16 rows of walls um, and to store like whether or not there is a wall you can just like have a one or a zero actually a better way to do this would probably be to have a 15 by 16 because you know that the edges of the maze are going to all be ones so you can store the center walls in an array um, and then just say like if it's equal to one then there's a wall if there's not if there's no wall, then it's equal to zero. And you can initialize all of these values to be zero as you're assuming an empty maze. And then you fill in the walls as you go using the IR sensors. Four by four maze. Um, yeah, we can start with the four by four. And the same logic would apply with the vertical walls. Or wait, sorry, I was saying horizontal that whole time. I was backwards. but. Um, yeah, what Tyler's drawing is a way you could think of the maze. You can see it's going to be like three by four or four we by three. We already know there's always a border wall. So you don't really need to keep track of it. It's kind of, if it makes your algorithm easier, then feel free. Like you have a lot of flexibility with how you implement this. But um, for actual maze, so you can see that vertical walls we're going to have. So for four by four, we have. Uh, so if we're doing, uh, yeah, so it's three, so it's four tall and then three, 
three wide. Um, I'm writing this this way because this is how you would index the array. It's a little confusing, but uh, for the horizontal, so vertical. So basically, just store like one or zero. If it's a zero, then there's no wall there. If it's a one, there's a there's a wall there. Um, or it's not. You don't, there's a lot of different ways to go. This is just one suggestion. Horizontal. So you'd index array. There's one, two, three. Four, it's four wide and three. <laughs> you know what I mean. Th three tall. So three by four. So um, that's, uh, that's that. Now for Manhattan dis distances, um, you could just have a four by four. Uh, yeah, just a four by four array. And that could store all your uh, all the distances in each cell. Uh, one catch is you need to initialize the maze uh, with Manhattan distances in it in order to work properly. Yeah. The nice thing with that, though, is you're going to initialize everything the same thing every time. So that's something that will be constant between all runs of the maze. And what you do at the start is you just, again, you assume no walls. Um, the center, the goal is that center cell. Or in a 16 by 16 maze, it's it's the group of four in the center of the maze. Yeah. And then when Brad, you, uh, yeah. sorry. Uh, and then you just fill outwards from there. And there's different ways you could do that. You could either just like define a starting array to have all these values. You could write a function to calculate Manhattan distance, um, go through each cell, put the Manhattan distance. You Or like if you want to take advantage of symmetry, you know that at the start, it's going to be symmetrical in all, all four directions because there's no, there's no walls. So you can calculate one, but also simultaneously fill in all, like calculate one quarter, like the bottom left corner, for example, and then like, mirror that on all things to initialize it. There's there's a lot of ways to do this. So it'd be a good leak code question or something. Like uh yeah. Oh given given this this array, like a uh, transform it in all four quadrants or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh how Bradley our yeah how we did it last year when we were doing this assignment. Um we just I, I just had a function that initial when the program was starting that just went through, populated it with the right values, and uh, used some absolute values. It's just math to figure out uh, what each cell should have initially. Um, yeah. Got any more questions about how flood fill works? Um, I haven't done queues in C++ before. I've done them in Java. Um, but is there like a specific library that we use or do we have to implement them ourselves or what? I would Ooh, love to answer a... this question so much. You have no idea how much I want to answer this question. Oh boy. Go for okay. it, Tyler. Let's see. Um, we, so C++ and Java are object oriented languages. And uh, so it, they, and they also, the way their queues work, um, they will, every time you want to add an item, they'll allocate some memory to store their objects. And it's like a, it's a, it's a list. But for microcontroller and for our purposes, that's a bit overkill um, because that the microcontrollers don't have a capped amount of memory. Um, so the way we'd recommend implementing a quasi Q thing is just as an array. So um, let's see. So let's say we have an array here. Let's give it. OK. So let's say I want to add in, the, and this was the, this was index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK. So let's say I want to queue up the number three, right? So I queue it and I stick it in, and I have a variable keeping track of where the front is. Front's right there, back's right there. Now I add the number seven and I keep going. But then when I, and then now the back changes. So 
Let's, let's add nine, one more. OK, so this is start and OK. So then whenever I DQ an item, like let's say take three off, instead of dealing with mixing pointers around and doing all this uh, pointer manipulation, um, you could just say, all right, I took one item off, so the start is going to shift up one. All right, now I'm here. And then uh, that's supposed to say start, trust me. Um, OK. Then, uh, yeah, circular array. That's right, Derek. So then keep going. Uh, let's pretend we put in a bunch of random values. So ends over here. And OK, then we can pop off values and then start will our start thing will shift over and then uh now when we try to add one more it's uh we do what's there's a little trick that's uh it's called a circular array right so um now we we say we want to add one more so then we have like a little bit of code it's like oh n should shift so it's at five, but our thing is size five. So now it should become zero. So the next time we add something, let's add it here. Then we'll add it here next, etc. Uh, and then once your end catches back up to start, that's when you know it's full and you should, uh, you know, you made your thing too small <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, let's see. There no STL version that we can use in C. Uh, oh, so no. <laughs> okay, I, I would like to. This is okay, I had on. I had a lecture on this actually on okay. Wednesday. Oh, yesterday. Basically, if you think about like the names of C plus plus versus C, C plus plus is just C with a bunch of fun, really nice things added onto it. Um, one of those nice things is having all these standardized libraries that you can call, like having templates, having objects, having the standard library. Um, those are not available to you in C. C is just all the base code. So short answer, no. Because there's no templates, like templates just aren't a feature of the C language. And because of that, they can't, you physically can't make STL library stands for standard template library. So, so you can't make it, you can't, you can't make a library for a generic type. Like you could, like if you define your own chord coordinate uh, struct and you want to make a queue for that, like let the feature to use the, use some generic code to process the uh, thing doesn't, doesn't work. Is it is there a way to copy the Qt implementation from C and just paste it into our project? Um, well, let's see. In C, I think it's defined as a template, isn't it? Yeah, well, in the standard template library, it is. Yeah. Um, so that, that won't work. What you could do is uh, you could copy and paste the code for a. Um, so you could. You could just replace the word template in their thing with uh, whatever you're trying to st stuff into your queue. So yeah. it's a coordinate struct. For example, a coordinate struct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. You can, uh, so I'd, so the right way to make a queue that's infinitely expandable is using dynamic allocation where you use malloc and free in C. Uh, and, it's good, but you shouldn't be using those things on a microcontroller because um, see. memory is a lot smaller. Okay, so you, you just set aside, decide how much you need, and then stick to that. So you need like a statically defined size uh, there. So dynamic allocation is a little more interesting. Um, what I'm trying to say is don't, don't make uh, you don't have to implement like a fancy queue. Like just do the array, a circular array, like just mentioned. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Good questions. Um, yeah, these are all important things. Bradley, I'm pretty sure more will come up as they start yeah. doing. Yeah. Make it. sure to post on Piazza if questions come up. Um, 
because other people probably have the same questions and will benefit from seeing what you have to say. Um, even just your questions may help other people think more too and just simplify things going down the line. We also, there's a chance we may add more functionality to the simulator depending on uh, it's more than, it's how much probably time. more than a chance. Uh, yeah, so more just a question uh, of when. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Just fun little features to add. Yeah. All right. Let's see. <sighs> Any other questions? James, turn your camera on. <laughs> See you, Tom. Why, why are you pulling me out like this? What if he's like in his pajamas or something? What if he's not wearing a shirt? <laughs> that's, even, that's even more reason to turn on, right? I'm kidding. Wait, I've been recording our... Uh... <laughs> Shoot, I have to cut that out. It's okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.